Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Why You Need Automation to Achieve Compliance in the Cloud. My name is Carol Auth of SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is AJ Yon, SANS instructor. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenter, please enter them into the questions window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to AJ. Thank you so much, Carol, and, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm coming live to you here from a Las Vegas hotel room. Uh, so uh, it's going to be a good webcast today. I just wanted to come on camera and, and let everyone know you're talking to a real person here. And we'll go ahead and, and get into this talk, that a really exciting talk that, that I'm excited to, to present to you all. And, uh, and definitely grateful for everyone that joined and, and SANS for uh, allowing me the opportunity to present today. So like Car uh, Carol mentioned, today we're going to talk about why we need automation to achieve compliance in the cloud. I'm excited to chat with you all today about this very important topic and one that I'm extremely passionate about. When Frank Kim and Dennis Scandrett from SANS reached out to me to help uh, co-teach and become a SANS instructor for SEC 557, Continuous Automation for Enterprise and Cloud Compliance, I really thought this course was made specifically for me. Uh, the author of the course, Clay Reisenhoover, put together an impressive course that aligns directly with my passions, experience, and interest in cybersecurity. And today's webcast is a part of a three-part series we are doing here at SANS to bring attention to SEC 557 and talk through some important concepts and examples of how to automate compliance in the cloud. I'm really excited about this first one, so let's go ahead and, and get started. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is AJ Yan. I am the co-founder and CEO of ByteCheck, which is a cybersecurity compliance startup uh, designed for one reason, to make compliance suck less. We built a SaaS platform that's designed to automate compliance assessments for startups and small businesses by integrating directly with cloud providers like AWS, Azure, GCP, and, and other cloud apps like GitHub, Jira, Bitbucket, and, and much more. I sit on a few professional boards, earned a few certifications, served for six years in the U.S. Army as a signal officer, both here in the States and overseas deployed. And lastly, as I mentioned, I'm currently an associate instructor or instructor candidate of SEC 557, Continuous Automation for Enterprises and Cloud Compliance. Enough about me, let's, let's go ahead and get into this. Before we do get into the talk, I did want to make sure you all were aware of the many SANS courses that we have underneath the cloud security pillar. There are lots of really amazing classes that are relevant to modern cloud environments. And I think it's important that uh, I mention relevant to modern cloud environments. I think often there's a lot of uh, security trainings or, or teachings out there that don't dive into the things that we really care about today. Uh, from the essentials of cloud security to a DevSecOps focus class that I'm really excited to take, cloud forensics, and, and many more. The course that I'm serving as an associate instructor is SEC 557 and falls under the cloud security curriculum here at SANS. I definitely encourage you all to check out these courses and, and join us in SEC 557 upcoming. So as I mentioned, today is the first of a three-part series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about why you need automation to achieve compliance in the cloud. In a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about how to leverage OS Query for compliance, a, a great tool that I've uh, come to love as a, as a retired former re recovering auditor. Uh, and, and then finally, we'll finish up with an easier way to multi-cloud and multi-account cloud compliance using Cloud Query. Uh, which is a, a, a flavor off of OS Query. So really excited about those upcoming ones. If you have not registered for either of those webcasts, definitely encourage you to do so. Uh, I'm sure Carol will, will drop some links in the chat. And if not, you'll, you'll be able to register just by going to sans.org. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna establish a baseline about why we need automation in the cloud. We're going to discuss the philosophy from the course from SEC 557 about automating compliance and, and why that's important. 
uh, it's important to think about it from a, a philosophical perspective, similar to like DevSecOps, where it's less about the tools, it's less about the technology that you're using, but it's a lot about how are you thinking about these things and how are you moving uh, through your organization and having these conversations uh, to encourage an automated mindset when it comes to compliance. So unfortunately, the brief demo will not occur uh, because of Murphy's Law. Uh, I tempted the travel gods and had a plan to catch a red eye last night from Las Vegas, where I'm, I'm currently at now for an AICPA conference where uh, Bite Check and, and, and my co-founder were here doing some stuff with the AICPA. Uh, but my flight, of course, was delayed and then canceled. And ultimately, I had to stay here in Las Vegas. And I'm conducting this webinar right here from my hotel room on my laptop. I don't have the SEC 557 virtual machines installed here. Uh, so the demo that I plan to do to walk you through some of these PowerShell commands, not going to be able to do today. But you will be able to see some of these demos uh, because I will be doing a follow-up YouTube video on the Cloud Security Channel walking through the demos that were, were planned for today. Uh, however, I did update the slides to show some screenshots of the commands in a, in a true auditor fashion. So you'll be able to see some of the commands that we were going to walk through today. And then, like I said, we'll follow up with a YouTube video of those commands in a few weeks. All right, so why automation for compliance? What's the need here? Why did Clay author this course, SEC 557? Uh, why did I start a company to automate compliance during the middle of a global pandemic? It's pretty simple. It's because we need it. If you're here today or you're re-watching this webcast on demand, you probably operate in a compliance role or interact with compliance regularly. I'm thinking we have a lot of people here that are compliance managers, director of information security, chief information security officers, uh, and, and, and many of, the other, of those other flavors uh, that have to deal with compliance in a re on a regular basis. And anyone that has dealt with compliance in recent years understands the business demand and the need for these assessments. But we all also understand the time-consuming nature of compliance. If you couple those challenges of the personnel that are being uh, taken out of their day jobs, the time spent with auditors, and then you add on the fact that organizations, the organizations you all work for, are adopting agile, lean, and DevSecOps philosophies, it's becoming even more and more difficult for auditors to keep up, to maintain the pace of how fast uh, organizations are moving and still performing their job as an auditor. And what this means is that security is being baked earlier on in the development cycle. We're seeing more ephemeral infrastructure that often means that systems or infrastructures being audited are not even living long enough to be audited. And this adoption of these principles uh, means we've seen a growth in things like infrastructure as code and automated security testing. Operations and uh, engineers personnel, th those folks expect speed and automation and DevOps related tools. Uh, they expect to be able to move fast without it, dis without it disrupting any of the other stuff that's going on. They need to hurry up and get things out. Um, and security is being baked earlier to allow them to do that. And you're starting to see this turn towards compliance from the operators and from the engineers. And it's time from the compliance side that we picked up the pace as well to keep up with our organizations. I know I've seen the rise of tools like Terraform, CloudFormation, Ansible, et cetera, uh, which allow engineers and operators to move faster. Uh, and this is where you can get really creative when it comes to compliance to keep up with that speed and automation. So prior to ByteCheck, I worked at a national cybersecurity compliance firm where we focused on SOC 2, ISO 27001, HIPAA and high trust examinations for a number of IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS providers. You, you know that full alphabet soup of compliance frameworks where you just, you know, got those three letters that you're collecting between SOC 2, ISO, HIPAA, high trust, and the like. We were doing all of those. While I was there, I quickly realized that manual testing just wasn't going to work. Organizations were using tools that to move fast and secure their applications, which for me was just leaving me behind on the audit side. 
I can only imagine how uh, internal compliance individuals feel when they're trying to assess compliance in their organizations, but have to rely on manual testing, have to rely on asking for screenshots of their engineers when their engineers and their operators are using tools that are automating everything else. One of the eye-opening things, one of the reasons why I started ByteCheck was because I realized that not only was I being left behind, and, and that's a tough feeling and, and a constant feeling really in cybersecurity of a feeling like you're always catching up because technology changes so fast, but I realized I was not performing quality work for my clients uh, because the information I was using during my audits was not accurately reflecting their environment. And this is why we need automation. A few weeks ago, I conducted a webinar with uh, our good friend, my good friends over at Chef Software. Uh, they're actually, and, and one side note here, if you attend SEC 557, you're going to get hands-on practice with a really great tool by Chef called Chef Inspect, which will go through and do some automated cloud compliance checks against CIS benchmarks and get to really get your hands dirty with a tool that I think everyone should really look into. But during this talk, there was there was this slide that you see here on the screen, which I, it's become my favorite slide when it comes to compliance. Where you see on the left side, assume compliance levels. And this is what we typically see in a SOC 2 report or some other report where it shows, okay, over the course of this entire 12 month period, compliance was perfect, right? Everything was looking great. All of the controls were operating effectively for X amount of time. But we know as professionals, as security professionals, that that's not reality. Uh, the reports that reflect an environment that was 100% compliant for an entire review or audit period uh, is, really, is really just not true. We know actual compliance levels go up and down in modern environments because things change so fast. Uh, infrastructure as code means resources can be deployed in seconds, uh, minutes, um, instead, of, instead of hours or days in the past. And, and auditors have to be able to change the way that they assess things because of this. Um, and I think that's the important piece here when we talk about automating compliance is we don't want to just get people a clean report. Uh, no one in information security is going to tell you that they are 100% secure. Um, similar, no one in compliance should tell you that they're 100% compliant, despite what their report says. It's really important that what we're doing is we're constantly checking uh, to see what is the status so we can have accurate data to allow management to make good decisions. And that's really what the goal is when it comes to automation, right? It's to reduce management uncertainty by providing actionable measurements in a timely way. Things are often misconfigured, changes are often made, uh, and you should do more as a compliance professional than just paint a pretty picture of compliance. We have to provide management with detailed information that accomplishes one goal, reduce that management, reduce uncertainty by providing actionable measurements. And this is what we're gonna focus on, not only today, but also in SEC 557. And if you notice here, I'm not saying that we need to provide perfect information, nor are we trying to provide or the goal of compliance is a clean audit report. That should never be the goal. Uh, when a third party auditor comes in to look at your tools, uh, you should probably want them to find something. You know? You're know, you paying a lot of money, you're spending a lot of time, and you want to improve your environment, not just check the box and get through this. Our goal with compliance automation is to provide management with enough information and in most cases, near real-time visualization at both the tactical and the strategic level uh, that allows them to make those decisions and fix issues in a timely manner. Now let's talk about SOC 2 for a little bit. And, and I carved out my career in the past at doing SOC 2. One of ByteCheck's main frameworks that we focus on is helping people achieve uh, getting their SOC 2 examinations. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to kind of uh, take a shot at myself here because I'm a, a SOC 2 uh, person. Uh, for those that are unaware, SOC 2 is a security reporting framework developed by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, or the AICPA, which is uh, the conference that I'm here in Las Vegas for right now. And it's designed to give service organizations, think SaaS companies or, or other service companies that are providing services to their customers, it provides them a format to have a third-party auditor 
attest to their security practices and processes. This report comes in a couple of flavors, the main one being a SOC 2 type 1, which, which is a point in time report. Uh, and, and, and then the other uh, report, which is more common, is a SOC 2 type 2, which is a report over a period of time, which typically 12 months. Now, a SOC 2 type 2 report is backwards looking, which means it reports on controls that operated effectively for a period of time in the past. As an example, an organization could have had a report that went from January 2020 through December 2020. And this report is what management, sales reps, and others will use until December 2021 to tell customers, prospects, leaders internally that they are, you know, quote unquote, SOC 2 compliant. Now let's 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 peel that back a little bit here as as we're going through this. We're talking about a report from January that started in January of 2020. That is a report through December of 2020. And I'm going to use that same document, that same report, to explain to my customers, to explain to management internally that all of my security practices and processes are, are good to go. Now, Yes, this is helpful to sales, I, I agree. And I'm not saying that there is any issue with uh, SOC 2 reports. I do think they have their place. Uh, however, how helpful is this to management internally? Can management really use a SOC 2 report that's from over a year ago? If we think about just today, it's July of 2021. And if I'm looking at a SOC 2 report from 2020, what exactly am I looking at if I'm management? What exactly am I being uh, told is going on in my environment when the testing that was performed was performed at least six months ago, and it covers that stuff that may be even 18 months ago, if we're looking all the way back till January 2020. And this is why we need to use automation. This is why when you're doing these compliance checks internally, you have to provide this near-time visualization so management is using updated information to make decisions. Although your auditors may come once a year and, and hopefully you're using tools that do some continuous monitoring and continuous compliance, internally, compliance checks can help you improve the security of your environment. I often hear in, in, in my role and, and over the years that security is not compliance. I 100% or compliance is not security. I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Compliance is not security. And I 100% agree. I, you can be 100% compliant. You can get a SOC 2, you can get an ISO, you can get all of these different alphabet super frameworks and not necessarily be secure, right? However, I do think compliance is security. I think these frameworks do lay out some really good basic principles that you should focus on to secure your environment. And that's what we need to think about as professionals. It's how do we leverage compliance to improve the security of our organization? And that's what automation will do. That's why traditional reporting is no longer going to work in these environments that you can't take weeks or months to perform reviews. You need to collect information regularly and provide that information to management in a streamlined and efficient manner. So I want to talk briefly about our philosophy on automating compliance and for the course, but it's really you know a philosophy that I've been living off of for for a little bit here as an auditor. It's and it's pretty simple. It's the job of compliance professionals, and when we say compliance professionals, for the sake of brevity, we're going to use the term this term to say anyone that's responsible for implementing, measuring, or validating compliance with enterprise policies, laws, and regulations. So it's the job of these individuals to reduce the uncertainty faced by management as they try to make decisions. We should provide information to assist management in understanding the risk in their environment, and we should do that visually rather than with written reports wherever possible. And don't get me wrong, uh, the author of the, of the course, Clay, is a certified public accountant and internal audit auditor. I am also a former auditor. We know that formal written reports have their place but most business decisions require a way faster input process. Now, how do we do this? Um, one of the cool things about SEC 557 and just being in this new modern world where there's so many tools 
is that you can leverage tools that your team is already using, your engineers are already using that are on the enterprise system. You use those tools and you let the administrators administer the tools that they're using. We're gonna demonstrate configuration activities on some of the tools where I was gonna demonstrate some of the configuration activities and some of the tools that uh, we use in class. And the goal is to show you how to use things which might already be available to you. And this is where living off the land and displaying the information visually means. Leverage the tools that are already installed and used by, used by your admins makes your life easier as a compliance professional. It also enables you with new skills to be more proficient in your job. I know when I chat with folks that are in compliance roles, when they can work with their engineers and figure out ways to reduce the amount of time their engineers are spending with third party auditors, they become kings and queens in their organizations. There's never really an engineer that's excited about going to chat with an auditor. So if you're able to take a tool that they're using or take tools that already exist in your environment and leverage those tools living off the land and let your administrators run them, you now have removed significant time that they would have had to spend with auditors later on. So the goal of this course and SEC 557 and, and even today's webcast is not to show you exactly how to do something in your organization. Uh, we all know that good security requires context and it requires a contextual approach to your organization. The tools that, you're, that I show today may not be available to you, right? The tools that uh, we discussed with OS Query and Cloud Query while OS Query is a cross virtualization, cross platform tool, maybe it doesn't make the most sense, but you should try to figure out what are these ubiquitous tools that I can use in my environment that can make my life easier, but also improve the lives of the engineers that are going through these examinations. So in SEC 557 and, and today's webcast, you're gonna see a heavy emphasis on PowerShell. And, and we chose PowerShell for a reason. It was a very strategic reason. It's a cross-platform scripting language, and I can hear all of the uh, Python uh, coders out there that are saying, well, Python is too, why didn't we choose that? Uh, we chose PowerShell just, just because it's uh, something that you won't see a, a heavy emphasis on uh, normally as a compliance professional, but it's installed in all of your Windows environments if you're there, and you can also use it on other OSs as well. Uh, Python, there's actually a really great Python course that wasn't on this cloud security curriculum, um, called SEC, 55, SEC 573 by Mark Baggett that I encourage everyone to take. It's a really great Python course. And when I said we're using this cross-platform scripting language, you were like, hold on, um, I, I wanna use PowerShell or Python for that. Definitely take SEC 573 and, and try that out. And that goes back to my point of, this isn't a you must do it this way type of webcast or course. This is one way to do things and you should really apply that context to your organization. So PowerShell is already in your environment, especially if you're, you're using Windows. Um, you can uninstall it on other operating systems as well um, if you want to, and that's a really nice bonus with PowerShell. It's built to handle structured data in a way that other languages are really not. Uh, you know, Python does have some good modules for handling things like XML and JSON, but PowerShell does do this natively. And it's very great with dealing with the sort of data that we deal with in the audit space. Uh, one of the things that I found is that it's very easy to interact and manipulate those .NET objects that come out of the object-oriented language of, of PowerShell. And this is why it makes it ideal for daily use by audit information security and compliance professionals. The object-oriented nature of the shell greatly simplifies the handling of data in the pipeline and the cross-platform compatibility in PowerShell Core allows us to run the same code on multiple operating systems. Uh, integrating with the Windows.NET framework in PowerShell 5.1 and the .NET Core framework in the cross-platform versions allows auditors or compliance professionals to extend this functionality of the language by including fully functional .NET objects in their code. So we're gonna talk a little bit about patching here to try to make this a little bit more tangible. Uh, this is a very important, but oftentimes overlooked security control 
that can be the difference between a system left alone or a system that is on the front page of the news because of a breach. Uh, patching is one of those things, uh, kind of like wearing a seatbelt. You know, we know we have to do it. We know we should do it regularly, but it's often missed. And you can usually trace a lot of bad incidents back to uh, an issue with patching. Now, any of you that have been working in this field for a while, especially if you have a bunch of Windows boxes, you understand what Tuesday uh, means. Uh, and, and most of the time this means that someone's complaining about their machine rebooting right before a, a meeting or, or things just not working. And now patching is critical to every operating system to ensure that known security flaws are corrected. We all know that Windows releases hot fixes uh, and these are the Patch Tuesday patches, which are intended to correct buggy software or patch those security flaws. When a hotfix is installed, new files are copied to disk by the installer. Um, and sometimes a backup directory or special registry entries are made. And then, this is, this is really important, the system is rebooted. Uh, why, 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 why is the system rebooted, though? The reason is, because if a patch installs a new DLL or executable used by a running process, uh, those files won't be used until the software is killed and restarted. Some processes like the LSAS or the local security administrator don't shut down. And, and if you want to update that, you need to fully reboot the system. And there's a few system files out there where a few additional system files where this really can only be accomplished with the reboot. Now here's a little little trick that I often use that I'll, I'll share with you all. When you're just coming in to try to get a sense of what's going on, oftentimes we'll do uh, readiness assessments or we'll uh, perform some other kind of initial look just to see where things are. You can go in and, and look at and see, hey, I, 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 this Windows box or these Windows boxes haven't been rebooted in 180 days. It's probably a sign the machine hasn't been properly patched. Now, you know, don't try to use this as a catch-all, be-all auditor trick to see that if patching is being done, obviously you need to dive a little bit deeper and we'll explain how to do that, but it's a really good quick way to see and get an azimuth check on, on how patching is occurring in the organization by just looking and have things been rebooted because if they haven't, like we mentioned, those running processes may not actually get that patch installed. Now, as a side note, this is not the case with Linux. Um, they can be patched without reboot, um, but uptime is a great indicator of whether patching is happening or not in a Windows environment. And we go through some Linux measurements in SEC 557 as well, uh, some of these same Linux measurements that we're talking about here um, today. Now, there's a couple of ways that we will measure patch info in an environment. Now, these are imperfect but very useful measurements to get a take on and get a feel for how patching is being done in the organization uh, obviously you know again security requires context compliance requires context if you're not um if you're saying hey this is not the way i want to uh, evaluate patching in my organization by all means find a different way but these are great quick measurements um, that you can get leveraging powershell the first measurement we take for systems, we'll call it patch age. Patch age is simply the number of days which have elapsed since the last time a patch was installed on the system. A low patch age does not necessarily mean the system is fully patched, but it does indicate that some patching activity has taken place recently. And in the Windows environment, we would expect this to be around 30 days because that's how often Microsoft releases those updates. And that's a good quick indicator that of have I been patched recently? Uh, a question that all Windows boxes should be asking themselves is, is have I been patched recently? And, and questions that you should be asking as a compliance professional. Now, patch velocity measures how many patches were applied on each date when the host was patched. <clears throat> and this can serve as a way to measure how frequently patching is happening in the environment. And let's remember the goal here. The goal of measurement is to reduce the uncertainty faced by management. 
So in the absence of better measurements, these easy to take measurements can offer some improved visibility. Now let's visualize this a little bit because again, it's important that we are doing things that are gonna matter when it comes to uh, providing this information to management. So here's an example of patching data for an enterprise uh, visualized in a Grafana dashboard. This dashboard is actually a dashboard we create in SEC 557, where you will take a CSV of a year's worth of patch data on a hundred different servers. You'll, inter you'll, you'll interact with it, use, you'll interact with that CSV using PowerShell, um, pull it in as some, and create some objects from it, and then you'll send the data to Grafana to display visually for management. And really to me, the best part about SEC 557 is the hands-on aspect. We're not just talking about these concepts, but you're also gonna get a ton of hands-on experience to develop and leverage the skills that you're taught. So this graph that you see here, this, this is something that you're gonna build from scratch, leveraging, a taking 100 servers uh, over a course of a year and be able to create a dashboard that looks like this. Now this Grafana dashboard shows us a few things that hits on both that strategic and the tactical information needed in a compliance assessment. So the average patch age here, um, and I'm trying to get my, my pointer going here. Let's get black, there we go. The average patch age measurement, again, like we talked about before, tells management the mean time since the organization's servers were patched. And this says that it's just over nine days. So if the enterprise standards that patches will be applied monthly, management can say, hey, we're good to go here. This is a low risk. I'm happy with seeing 9.3. That's exactly what I wanna see here. Now the graph at the bottom, this is where we're gonna look at the patch velocity. This shows the average patch age over time. This, that's the green area of the graph, this part here, with the number of patches installed on each date. So you, this yellow, these yellow bars are gonna show you the number of patches, and apologies for my, for my terrible writing here. Uh, but uh, you get the point here, right? Uh, you get uh, that we have the yellow is showing us the number of patches installed on each date, and the green area of this graph uh, has the is, is showing you the average patch age over time. Now, this allows management and compliance staff to view compliance history and see the velocity of work being performed. Now, this graph actually shows us what we need to see. We should see the patch age increase over time, as we're seeing here, as this green graph is growing, going up, but then drop off because the organization is on a 30-day patch cycle. So you see, we get up here around 25 days uh, since patching happened, and then it drops off again, or so that because that 30-day cycle has hit, and you see that uptick in number of patches installed on that day. So this is perfect. This is exactly what we want to see. Now, what I often see in the audit space, um, and I'm sure you have some, some of you have seen this in your day jobs as well, is that we often see right before a compliance assessment, right before the auditor comes in, and, and let me get my, uh, my, my pen here up again, where you're gonna see a graph like this. It's you know, we're just going over time, and then all of a sudden we see a spike in patching. Whoa, what happened there? Um, and then we go back to no patching. So there's no patching for a long time. And then all of a sudden everything is patched. Now, will this pass an audit? Uh, of course, uh, you know, auditor comes in and they see, hey, you patched all your servers, you're gonna get probably a thumbs up. But this doesn't really provide management accurate info on how the patching process is being handled. Uh, because if we unpack this, why did all this patching happen here? Chances are an auditor was coming in right on this date. So right before the auditor showed up, oh no, we got a patch, we got a patch, we got a patch. All the systems were patched. And yes, you're gonna get your audit report. Yes, everything's gonna look good, but management needs to know, hey, this we're not doing things in accordance with our policy. The patch velocity is not what I wanna see. And I wanna see this graph that looks a lot like down here and not like this graph that's up here. And this is where that visualization becomes really helpful because management can see how controls are performing over time, not just a point in time, which is what happens when you have auditors coming in once a year. So this handles that strategic nature of the conversation, right? 
we know how the patch process is holding up because we can see patch age and patch velocity. But what about that tactical info? You know, the system administrator, you know, they're the ones doing a lot of this work, but they don't necessarily care about all of this stuff over time and average patch age. They just want to know, hey, are there any issues that I can that I can fix or that I need to fix? And you know, everything here looks great for the CIO. Everything great, everything looks great for the board and, and management. But the sysadmin might have some additional information at that tactical level that they need. And now remember, we created this dashboard from data of a whole 12, for 12 months on 100 servers. And on the right side here, on, you see server 79. You know, it's always server 79 that gives us issues, right? Uh, that hasn't been patched in 106 days. Now, that's significantly different than the rest of these that are falling in accordance with the policy. And this is where that tactical information is very useful and helpful because operation staff, system administrators can go and find out what's going on with server 79. What's happening here that there has, this hasn't been patched in 106 days, but everything is being patched. Did this fall off somewhere? Uh, is there somebody messing with something that they're not supposed to? And now this gives that tactical look into what do I need to go do to address this? So yes, we're figuring out, are we gonna pass our patch control? But we're also telling people the information that matters. We're leveraging PowerShell, we're leveraging tools that they are able to use and are able to collect a hundred different servers of patch information, display it visually and allowing management to make those decisions. Allowing them to know that you know things are going well compliance wise, but at the same time, there's a weakness here that we need to address. All right, and this is where I we would have performed a demo, uh, and uh, I'm going to actually get into showing some screenshots. But one of the really great things about Sec 57 is that we follow a similar method of how I learn things in the military. Uh, if any of you listening to this have have been in the military, you understand that when we learn land navigation, we were taught with a compass and a map. We learned the manual way of how to navigate, the manual way of how to uh, read different terrain and, and understand how to read the map. Uh, but we all knew GPS exists. Uh, we all know that you can be able to use tools out there. And once you get to your unit, you actually have some of these cool technologies to use. But it's very important to learn that basic and manual aspect first. It's very important to follow that crawl, walk, run method. And that's something that we do in SEC 557. So we usually start here first by just taking some simple measurements in a manual fashion on a particular one box. And then we get into that fully automated version of pulling in hundreds of servers, months of data in to fully automate things. So a couple of the example commands that we were going to display today to help, um, help you all visualize this and understand this a little bit more, uh, we're going to be around patch velocity and patch age and show you how we pulled some of this in. So to measure patch velocity on a Windows system, you're going to run this git hotfix um, command. And you're going to group it by their installed on property. You're going to group it, this group object commandlet. And that's going to tell us that, okay, we installed two patches on 5.11.2020. We installed four patches on January 6, 2021. And I can start to get a little bit of an understanding of what's going on in this machine from a patch velocity perspective. Patch age is also easy to measure. You're simply going to calculate the number of days between today. So again, we're going to run that git hotfix. We're going to um, sort it by its installed on date and put it in a descending fashion. Um, and then if anyone knows uh, PowerShell or, or some of these other uh, uh, tools, um, you're going to pipe, this is a pipeline operator, you're going to pipe this, the output here, um, and I want to select the first one. I want to see what's that first installed on date that we're getting, and I, and I stored this in this last patch date variable. And then it's very simple. Um, I'm going to then calculate the number of days between today, this new time span come landlet, and that last patch date that I just collected over there, and I'm going to use the get date commandlet to find out how many days between today and the latest installed on date that we returned here. 
very simple, very straightforward commands that you're going to learn in SEC 557. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a manual, quick way of doing it just on one machine. But you, we, in the class, we use this same, and you can do it in your own environments, these same commands and a few other PowerShell commands to build a script that gets this data across 100 servers. Uh, and then we, do, we send it over to Grafana, that, as we saw on that last slide. Another demonstration that uh, we were going to do today, and as a reminder, I will still be conducting these demos uh, just on a YouTube video and a, and a couple of days later that we'll post so that you can see them in action. Uh, but I did want to show you that we can use PowerShell with cloud providers as well. Uh, a lot of you all probably are hosted in the cloud and you're, you may be thinking to yourself, like, this is great and all, AJ, but um, I want to be able to... Um, Sorry about that, I lost control of my mouse there. There we go. Uh, I wanna be able to collect some of this data in the cloud. Can I use PowerShell to collect that data in the cloud as well? Uh, and yes, you can. Uh, this is the beauty of a tool like this where you can install modules and uh, leverage and interact with different cloud providers. But we'll show you some AWS stuff here because in the course, we actually do AWS CIS benchmark testing to determine if our AWS accounts are meeting security best practices. The AWS module uh, allows you to gather data from your AWS resources, and it's capable of managing and querying many of the services that AWS offers. And, and if you know anything about AWS, they offer a lot of services. So this module contains thousands of commandlets, and many of those are the Git commands. And if you're used to using the AWS CLI like myself, one of the things that I found were the commands from in PowerShell and that PowerShell AWS module, there's generally a one-for-one -one match between a PowerShell AWS command and, or AWS commandlet and an AWS CLI command. So if you're familiar with the CLI, it makes it a lot easier to mentally convert from one command type to another. Most of those AWS CLI commands return JSON formatted data, which you can easily convert to an object, but the equivalent commandlets do the conversion for you and provide objects for your scripts to consume. During SEC 557, we do go through a lab using Chef Inspect to perform the same CIS benchmarks that I'm going to demonstrate in that follow-up YouTube video in an automated fashion and at scale. Think multiple accounts, uh, multiple regions, we're going to be able to perform all of the critical CIS uh, benchmark controls in the cloud uh, in an automated fashion using Chef Inspect. Now on the screen here, you're seeing a few of the CIS controls that are around IAM settings, and it really shows you the power of being able to quickly interact with PowerShell objects from an AWS account. These Git IAM PowerShell queries are gonna display some very valuable information. For example, AWS Benchmark, CIS Benchmark Control 1.4 recommends that you should have no access keys associated with your root account. So you would use this Git Account Summary commandlet here, this one here, to get that information. And that's gonna tell you the age or if there's any access keys present on the overall account. You can also, instead of running Git IAM account summary, you could um, go ahead and just get that property that you're looking for right there um, by running a, a command. And, and this is another one that you'll, you'll see in the demo, but dot account access keys present. And I'm not gonna write all that out with this pen, but you get the point. Um, and that will tell you exactly um, if there's any root account, any root, uh, uh, if the root account has any uh, access keys associated with it, which is against best practices. You'll also be able to check, does that root account user um, have MFA enabled? So one of the cool things are, is once you are, once you run this commandlet and you, you know, dot account access keys or dot account MFA enabled, you're able to get that direct property that you're looking for um, once, you, once you run this commandlet. Now there's a number of other commands. For example, AWS can, CIS control, uh, 1.8 recommends a minimum password length of 14 characters. So you're gonna be able to get that using this Git IAM account password policy. You see here we can get user lists, role lists, users, uh, many other things such as CloudTrail. <clears throat> we can uh, 
go through each user in your AWS account and check a lot of these things using for each loops, which we will do in SEC 557 as well. All this to show you that you know it's very possible to go and get this information. Um, and obviously, a lot of this in the cloud, especially manual testing, is not going to cut it. And that's where some of those for each loops come into play using tools like Chef and Spec come into play as well, where you can check these things at scale and again, provide that information to management to reduce management uncertainty and allow them to make quick decisions. Uh, this is information that management definitely wants to know when or if it changes. And imagine you're able to automatically provide information showing that not only do you know what's going on, but hey, it's, it's meeting the right requirements when it comes to the CIS benchmarks, which we all should be looking to uh, looking to follow. Now I know Carol's been monitoring the the chat here for any questions, and I don't think I've seen any come through just yet. But um, I do uh, want to take some time here to just remind you again that we I will be conducting that demo. You will get some of that hands-on live aspect here to see some of those PowerShell commands, um, but uh it's going to it, and you'll be able to see some of these things but again i'll be showing you, you know one-off little manual checks with powershell <clears throat> but it's it's going to be able to hopefully allow you to visualize how do i do this at scale and it looks like we have one question here that just came in um that that uh uh from from somebody attending what do you think about compliance as code any tools or suggestions how to implement this process yeah, so I, I think that's actually the webinar that I did with Chef that I mentioned earlier where I pulled that slide. The title of it was Compliance as Code, the New Frontier, or maybe the New Frontier Compliance as Code. I don't know if I have that backwards or not, but the idea is the same. Uh, I do believe that we need to get more to a compliance as code process and a compliance as code evaluation. Uh, because if you think about it just from a language perspective, right? Right now, many of the problems with compliance are that your compliance personnel, your security personnel, your engineers, your operators, your board, everybody speaks a different language. Everyone's thinking about these things differently. So when security asks for information, they're asking for some different flavor. When compliance asks for information, they're asking for a different flavor. And engineers are just bogged down. So if we all can move to the same language, the same a central way of looking at things, which compliance, which code is a ubiquitous language where most people can understand it, especially you don't have to be a developer to understand it, but at least you can leverage tools uh, to get that information. I think that's the future. I think that's the way, especially because of infrastructure as code, right? Uh, we should be looking at some of these, uh, uh, looking at what's going on in Terraform, looking at what's going on in the uh, Ansible cookbook. We should be looking at Chef as well to see what are, how are you configuring things and there's a lot of great tools out there that will do some scans of infrastructure as code related tools to to ensure that uh, you're doing things you're not doing any purposeful misconfigurations there's a new one on aws uh, that's related to cloud formation i think it's called cloud formation guard and, and i may have that wrong uh, but it's a great way to perform those tests on on that infrastructure as code environment now, when it comes to tools or suggestions of how to implement this process, I'm going to go back to our course philosophy. Uh, use tools that are already in your environment. I, I imagine that in most modern environments, folks are using Terraform or some form of, of infrastructure as code type of tool. Uh, folks are using things that have that DevOps, DevSecOps mentality. And go out and see how you can leverage those tools. Uh, Terraform, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, uh, all are great tools that have a lot of ways that you can do this compliance as code evaluations. Also next week, um, or in a couple of weeks, I'll be doing a webinar on OS query and how to leverage OS query for some of this stuff, um, in which OS query is really powerful. And the reason I'm doing OS query is because it's cross-platform again. I can do it, I can run a lot of the same commands and interact with the same tables on a Mac OS, Linux box, or a Windows box, which makes things a lot easier from a compliance perspective because you can just focus on the query that you're running in OS query instead of the technology that your organization is using. Great question, thanks for asking. 
That's all the questions I see, AJ. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for, for joining. I, I really appreciated this. I'm extremely um, grateful for the opportunity. Uh, I will be speaking again, uh, leveraging OS query for compliance in two weeks, and then following that up two weeks later on part three with a cloud query webcast. Uh, so thanks again for joining. Carol, I will turn it back over to you. And uh, thanks, everyone. Hope to see you all on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Feel free to reach out to me. All right. Thank you so much, AJ, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.